and welcome to our second program in the series The Voice of the Cantor. We are trying to get to grips with what is happening around the world in the field of the cantorate, synagogues and everything appertaining to um, this type of problem that we have been incurring over the number of years. With these special sessions, we hope to give you the answers to some of the questions you've always wanted to ask, but haven't had the opportunity to do so. I would like to hand over to our moderator, who will take us through this wonderful session with our special guests. Thank you for listening and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm Russell Grossman. Uh, I'm your moderator for today. And um, I'm delighted, actually, that we've got uh, three highly distinguished cantors to discuss this issue of crossing the pond, which is the second in our series of Voice of the Cantor. Uh, we have our participants for uh, just under an hour, so we're going to try and uh, motor through some questions that I will be asking them, uh, but also a reminder that towards the end of the session we will of course be uh, opening this up for general, general questions. Um, your choice really whether you want to put those questions in the chat or not, uh, whether you want to voice them, we'll see how this goes. This is the second in our series, so we're still kind of feeling our way a little bit uh, in terms of process and procedure. But without further ado, I want to introduce the people that we have today. Uh, the first cantor that we have is Cantor Benny Rogodzinitsky. Uh, cantor Benny, as he's known, is a renowned cantor lecturer, teacher, mentor and event producer. Uh, he serves as cantor at the historic Park East Synagogue, uh, which is located on Manhattan's Upper East Side. It's a shul that I personally have dabbled in uh, a number of times, uh, and together, of course, with Cantor Benny, uh, uh, amongst other things, is the maestro Russell Gurr, uh, who uh, conducts the choir there. Born in Liverpool, uh, England, that's Liverpool, England, Cantor Benny earned a bachelor's degree in Talmudic studies in Manchester Yeshiva, and separately an advanced degree in music. He's performed for audiences of thousands at some of the world's most prestigious venues, including the White House and the United Nations. As a lecturer of music and its application to prayer, Cantor Benny routinely studies and practices both traditional and modern liturgy and music. In 2012, he worked with Sony Music on the production and marketing of the historic album and concert series, Eternal Echoes, Songs and Dances for the Soul, which was a collaboration between world famous violinist Yitzhak Perlman and cantor Yitzhak Meir Helfgott, uh, who is of course the chief cantor at uh, Benny Shul Park East Synagogue. He also leads marketing and community engagement efforts for both the synagogue and the Rabbi Arthur Schneier Park East Day School, uh, where he serves as director. He serves on the board of several char charitable organizations and is the co-founder of Cantor's World and the founder of From Divorce. So uh, welcome to Cantor Benny, and I'll introduce our other two cantors. Um, Cantor Jason Green is a native of Montreal, Canada. Uh, he's a lyric tenor. He began singing at age six as a child soprano in his synagogue's choir. He became its conductor at age 15 under the tutelage of Stephen Glass. He continued his vocal development and knowledge of repertoire by joining the Shah Shemaim Synagogue Choir in 1992, soon afterwards becoming its associate conductor. Cantor Green holds a diploma in Nusach Hatafila and Chazanut from the London School of Jewish Studies, having studied primarily with Cantor Stephen Robbins, who was one of my own teachers. He studied voice production with Cantor Jerome Kopmar and Robert Davis. He was certified in January of 2007 as a member of the Cantor's Assembly, the world's largest professional organization of cantors. And in 2011, uh, Cantor Green received his cantorial commission from the Cantor's Assembly. Since 2004, Cantor Green has held cantorial positions <coughs> in the United States and in London. Uh, that's London, England, incidentally, not London, Ontario. And since May 2018, he's proudly served a KBI congregation, that's Kehillat Bet Israel congregation in Ottawa, which is in fact the flagship synagogue in Ottawa. He's known for his professional quality volunteer adults and youth choirs, a caring and inspiring approach to teaching all ages, his innovative B'nai Mitzvah study program, and a warm and engaging personality. Uh, Cantor Green is married to Jody, and they have 
three wonderful sons. Uh, and I uh, didn't uh, add that uh, Canterbury, of course, is married with four children and resides in New York. And then our third cantor this evening is Rabbi Cantor Gershon Sillins, who has worked at West London Synagogue since 2020 with specific responsibility for their adult bar and bat mitzvah program and some of their pastoral work with elderly and isolated members. Previously, Rabbi Gershon was on the rabbinic team of liberal Judaism, serving communities in Lincolnshire, Norwich, Stevenage and Manchester. Ordained as a rabbi by Leo Beck College in 2019, he is the first and so far we believe the only rabbi cantor in the progressive movement in the United Kingdom. Before arriving in London, he served as cantor at Temple Sinai Congregation in Toronto, where I think, Gershon, you have at least one follower tonight. Uh, and before that at various synagogues ac across the USA during a long and distinguished career. Uh, his essay, The Discussion of Music in Lawrence A. Hoffman's The Art of Public Prayer, appeared in the CCAR journal, reflecting his time serving on the board of the American Conference of Cantors and on the Worship and Music Commission for the Union for Reform Judaism. He was ordained as a cantor in 1990 uh, and received the degree of Master of Sacred Music from Hebrew Union College in New York, and in 2015 was awarded the degree of Doctor of Sacred Music in recognition of his service to the American Cantorate very uh, distinguished bios from three distinguished uh, cantors. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask each in turn, I'm going to start with Cantor Benny, um, really asking you, firstly, um, we're going to get on to the, the kind of crossing the pond bit, but firstly, I just want to ask you, how did you get your first job? Uh, so first of all, good afternoon. It's wonderful to be with you. And, and if I may, I just want to recognize both you and Alex for the wonderful work and the entire team can I just say as a diversion to your question, though I'm going to answer it, that people often say to me that, oh, Chaz Chazanud is dead, Chazanud needs to be buried, Chazanud is a historical music, but it's nothing that's current. And every time I get one of your emails that talks about programming that you have, it just, it gives me such inspiration. And usually Americans like to think that they're in the lead of everything, but I think uh, Britain's taking over when it comes to maintaining and preserving Chazanud. So that's just my, uh, as a side. Um, my first job in Chazanud, I actually got when I was in Manchester, England, when I was 16. However, my first foray into the world of Chazanud, I got when I was a kid as a gift for my father. We were in Johannesburg, South Africa. And my dad on Rosh Chodesh said to me, if I behaved, and I forget what the, the barometer was for my behavior, uh, he would take me to the great synagogue in Yeovil to hear Cantor Johnny Gluck and a blessed memory. And I remember it like today, walking into the shul, seeing this magnificent sanctuary together with a choir and a chazan that truly had a golden voice. And that memory has stuck with me from then until today. So I would say that is the first foray that I had into the world, world of cantorial music. Excellent, thank you very much. Jason, how did you get your first job? <laughs> So uh, my first job, I think, was a, an outgrowth of my first experiences with the synagogue and the choir when I was five years old. You know, I, uh, my uncle brought me to synagogue. I think my parents were away on a, a weekend, whatever, and they brought me to synagogue, and it was Rosh, Shabbat Rosh Chodesh, and I heard, Yamba bim bam hodu Hashem, and I was in the choir the week after that. So um, that was sort of my, uh, you know, choir singing uh, took me through right up until my mid 20s uh, singing in the synagogue choir, conducting the synagogue choir, thanks to, uh, to Stephen Glass, who's here with us today, um, who taught me uh, that entire uh, side of things, plus all the experience that I had uh, from, from that uh, in um, choral music, choral composition, and, and arranging. Um, and it was sort of in my blood. Uh, it was sort of a, a natural uh, step for me to move towards the cantorate, although it was really born out of uh, the fact that I was leading services in my 20s and uh, early 20s and, and everywhere I could volunteer. And I was, you know, a shliach tzibur in five different shuls in, in, in Baltimore. And uh, on those weekends where I couldn't lead services, I felt something was missing. So my wife said to me, you know, go make a career career out of this go learn properly not you know do it uh, the right way and um so my first position was actually a um a shabbat part-time position at a synagogue that had lost their cantor and you know it was basically to do you know what i did on at my bar mitzvah lead services um 
but that quickly developed into uh, we need you for holidays and so on and so forth. So that was when I, you know, what, what my wife said, you know, and the necessity to learn quickly, uh, I called, of course, like an obvious choice for me, Cantor Stephen Robbins, who, for whom I'd been conducting the High Holidays Parallel Services Choir at the Shar Shemaim for years. Um, you know, and, and, he, and he taught me, and he taught me, uh, it was an amazing experience. But you know, like he started teaching me while I was on the bima with him conducting the choir. He would lean into me and say, you know, watch, watch what I do with, um, you know, Vayecherad Kol Ha'am. Vayecherad Kol Ha'am. And you feel, it would shake the amud. You know, uh, so, and, or, Mashiv Haruach Umorid Hagashem. You could feel the rain coming down. You know, so it, it, it was obvious to me this was, I loved it, I related to it, I connected with the tefillot, and, uh, and so I, you know, I brought that into my, into my first part-time position, you know, in Baltimore. That was my first, uh, my first job. Thank you, thank you. Gershon, what about you? Uh, how did you get your first job? <laughs> it's hard to know which things count as jobs. I, um, uh, first of all, I do want to say that uh, as wonderful as the Chazanut is, uh, as you've reported in the United Kingdom, it's fabulous in Canada. You can get a big audience of people for Chazanut in Canada that I, I was amazed at. And some of the Chazanim that have served in the congregations there, just fabulous. Uh, they, they come and go in each one better than the other. I don't even want to go into names. You know them. They're wonderful. And that's just Toronto that I know, but also Montreal. I'm not going to go on, but uh, Canada really punches above its weight in Chazanut. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, the cantor that was at the Reform, the American Reform congregation that I grew up in was Robert Hanberger of Blessed Memory, a wonderful voice, not a traditional Chazan at all, although he probably had traditional Chazanut in his background, but it wasn't what we did in the reform movement. Uh, but I loved the music there. I loved singing, would uh, sing along with him and so forth. When I was 14, I got uh, what really was my first job. I was paid $75, $75 for singing in the High Holiday Choir at Lincolnwood Congregation uh, right near Chicago with uh, uh, cantor Herman Katz, who was, I think, a lot better than I knew at the time. I don't know if anybody uh, knew him in those days, uh, but he was a, a lovely singer and very kind to me. Uh, and so I sang in synagogue choirs for a while, uh, finally was hired as a cantorial soloist in a small uh, congregation in Michigan, and then did that for a while uh, with re remarkably little knowledge, uh, and uh, then uh, finally decided to uh, attend the Hebrew Union College School of Sacred Music, um, and then served a number of communities there. My first congregation out of uh, Hebrew Union College would have been uh, uh, the uh, congregation on Long Island in um, Oceanside, the Reform Congregation in Oceanside. Uh, there have been lots of others, but that's more or less the, the picture. Um, I uh, have had the great honor of being on the same stage with some wonderful traditional chazanim. They, what they do, I can only... <laughs> I'm unbelievably impressed by it. I love it. I can't do it. But uh, what I do bring to it is a love of Jewish music. And uh, it's always an honor to be uh, with uh, such uh, accomplished uh, and unique singers. The, the role of Chazanut in Jewish life deserves to be elevated. It does not, it virtually, we'll talk about it later, it virtually doesn't exist in uh, British progressive uh, Judaism. Uh, and it would be lovely to to have more of it. We'll talk more. No, thank you. We will talk more. And um, uh, Benny Gershon has, t has uh, touched on a couple of things, which actually lead into my next question to all three of you. And I'm going to ask Benny first, which is uh, who who or what was your most important role model as you have progressed through the cantorate? It's a very good question. Um, if I were to talk about a chazan that I never met, but a role model as far as a uh, a deeply devout man and chazna, I would say, was Yosla Rosenblatt. When I was a, a kid and my mother w used to put me to sleep, she would sing for me uh, some of Rosenblatt's uh, pieces. And um, it, it touched me deeply. And so I would say that even today, I, uh, he's a role model that I look up to. And I wish, 
you know, they give you some of these questions on Jeopardy. If you had a million dollars, who could you meet? <laughs> he is certainly one man that I, I would just want to meet and talk to and find out about. But I would say that my music, is infused not only with heavy chazanut, but also with Karl Bach and Debbie Friedman and other classics of more contemporary chazan, uh, chazanim and singers. Uh, so I, I always look at it that when I take a Shabbat off and I go to, to listen to either a chazan or a baal I want to walk away with something. Even one idea, one motif, one nigun that I didn't think about before. So I would say Rosenblatt is the short answer, but many, many chazanim is the long answer. Gershon, do you, do you have a short answer? Hmm. Well, it would be really, uh, uh, it would be Cantor Lawrence Avery. Hmm. When I first went to uh, HUC to decide where I might, whether I wanted to uh, go there for cantorial school, uh, I went to his class. And I can still remember hearing, he had a, I don't know if people remember him, he had a lovely, delicate, leggero tenor voice, uh, a completely elegant man, both in, in his appearance and his singing. And um, uh, he sang the opening from the Kachko collection. Uh, he was teaching the class that I wasn't a member of it yet. And I remember him singing, Le Chun Ramena Ladonai Maria Le Tsurishenu. And it was a moment of great inspiration for me. I'd been listening to, um, uh, you know, I, I have a classical music background and had been singing professionally in that for, for many years. And he was just everything that I could have imagined in terms of elegance of singing. And then this style that just intrigued me so much. I thought, I want to, I want to learn how to do that. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, so Jason, who, who is your role model? So I, I feel like I'm privileged that I got to study with the person who was my role model from the time that I was thinking about being a Chazan. So Steve Robbins, and not just on the voice, not just on the, the Nusach, but on turning tefillah, sorry, sorry, turning Nusach into tefillah. Right, making it real, making it um, uh, meaningful. But I, I, I think, uh, you know, to, to turn on the creative juices, I would get in a time machine and I would just travel back to the golden age of Chazanut because it's so, I love the music. I am not also, I am also not that cantor who, um, who has heavy Chazanut in my services. It's not mm -hmm. something I trained in uh, extensively because at the time, like now, um, it, it wasn't, uh, in demand in, in the synagogues that I was that I was working in. It was more about singing and congregational participation and so forth, and it still is to this day. Um, but that's, that is not to say that, that the Chazanim of the Golden Age of Chazanut is, which is, for those who don't know, sort of between the two world wars, but the, you know, the great Skusevitsky and, 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 and so many others, I, we, can, we can go in, um, it can go on forever, but just the, the quality of the voices the um, the dex not dexterity but the malleability the the um, you know the the power not just in volume but I'm talking about the power to 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 inspire and to make us feel emotional uh, in so many different ways while we're we're listening to the davening I would spend time with all of them if I could thank you well I want to get on to this subject of crossing the pond now because uh, the thing that is uh, relatively unique about the three of you is you have worked both in the UK and the US. Uh, US is a, a wider term for general North America. Uh, well, let's say North America. Uh, North, North America. <laughs> as a proud Canadian I do want to, as well as an American, <laughs> I do want to say we're not uh, you know the 52nd state or whatever. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Very good, very good. So I uh, will edit that bit out now. So um, oh, no worries. <laughs> so you've you've both worked. You, you've all three of you have worked across uh, UK and US. Um, Jason, I think you've crossed at least twice, and uh, Gershon as well. Uh, you, you've been quite prolific in that. So I obviously want to ask you, uh, what is, in your view, the difference between practice in your experience between the UK and the US? Or maybe it's not it's not different at all. Benny, what do you think? So I, I want to be clear that I answer only from my very personal vantage point. It doesn't represent what other synagogues do, not even in the Orthodox world where I am associated. But I would say the one very stark difference was that in England, um, there was more formality, more covod of 
tefillah, more a sense of uh, respect for the tradition, for the music, the blue book, the, the way that the, the, the so, uh, songs and melodies had been sung, not only chazanut, the minagim of kihilot. And when I came to Manhattan, what I found was it was a little bit the Wild West. Not only that I was at that time a cantor on the West Side, but it was that, yes, certainly Kol Nidre had to be sung with the, with the tradition, but you could do pretty much what you wanted. And, and you know, there's a saying in Yiddish, das is was the oil vil. That's what people <laughs> want. And it, and it struck me very much like I had come from this, you know, very, very regimented sort of tefillah, following tradition, going to the Gabai before Shabbat to ask him what the different traditions were in a shul like uh, Sale or Brighton, and then coming to Manhattan and being told, you know, you're on your own. Hmm, interesting. And, and, and do you think that since you've been at Park East, you've made it your own, or have you brought more of the UK Anglo tradition into the services? So I think there's a mix. I've certainly tried to, um, to educate the, 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 the congregation, for lack of a better word, by the way, I say that with humility, um, to, to the fact that, yes, while you could put in nigunim and while you could change in certain areas and bring in your own ideas, you must stick with the nusach. And I, I bring that as an example uh, for the Karlbach Friday night, which I'm a big fan of. But I don't think one can uh, daven the Karlbach Friday night without giving the framework of traditional Nusach. And that's what I've tried to do in Shul, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, obviously singing the Sanatokif, Rosh Hashanah Yikasevan, but then allowing uh, different areas, bringing in new, new melodies while respecting those and uh, the traditions of yesteryear. This is, of course, what I have to say. We do have a separate session on Karl Bach. I think it's April the 28th. Tune into that, um, etc. But Benny, you've also got a choir, and I've listened to that choir. It's a fantastic choir. I had a privilege, I think, two years ago of um, attending Slichus, actually. First night Slichus there. Um, Russell Gerav, I already mentioned. Do you, do you feel that having a choir to your point about the Wild West. Do you feel that having a choir has allowed the congregation to ground itself more in essential nusach and essential melodies that we would regard as traditional? So the answer is yes and no. And there, by the way, uh, you know, I serve alongside my dear friend, Cantor Helfgott, who is the chief cantor of the synagogue. And it's what's interesting is, you know, often ko chazanim don't work out, you know, because there's competition between the two. Um, but in this way, I think we're very different. Kanta Helfgott, based on his type of chazanut, the traditional old-time chazanut, I think what he brings to the table is wonderful, and that is where the choir shines. When I sing, however, I like to imagine that the kahal is the choir. And the reason for that is that when, when you have a formal choir, certainly in Park East, people take a step back. They become a lot more of the audience. When I lead services, often Kanta Helfgott will say to me, you know, Benny, could you share with me? What did you sing? What was this nigun? I heard the people joining in. And the best advice that I've given him, by the way, is sometimes to ask the piano to sing a little bit, uh, not the piano, sorry, to ask the choir to sing a little bit softer and allow the congregation to sing a little bit uh, louder. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I, this is where I give a plug for our Who Needs Nusach session, which is also in this series, A Voice of the Counter, co coming up. But we haven't spoken before about this, Benny, but thank you very much for the, uh, for the opportunity. So, um, Jason, your experience having crossed hither and thither uh, in terms of the pond, what, what do you think is different or the same? Um, so I would say, first of all, I think uh, I have a, a lot of common experience uh, and, and perception of their experience as Benny. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of uh, leave for another piece of the, that, dis, that dis, um, discussion. But, uh, you know, the the matbea when I was there versus here or anywhere in the states has basically been the same. You know, it's Ashkenazi uh, nusach, and I am very, very much a proponent proponent of nusach and and the traditions and teaching it. Um, it's really, really important. So this, you know the um, the differences were more in the melodies and the tropes and the attitudes towards the melodies. Um, I've had a choir wherever I've been, and my use of the choir is to, is kind of, well, threefold, I guess. I mean, there's a number of different um, reasons to have a choir and do it the way that I do it. Um, my choir is meant to provide a, uh, a different flavor, a choral uh, flavor, to the traditional prayers. 
so they res do a lot of responses uh, within the nusach. Um, and then some compositions that are meant to be um, familiar to the congregation, wherever I am, I'm choosing, I'm arranging or rearranging um, pieces that um, are going to be familiar to the congregation before I'm like, I'm not focusing on trying to, um, you know, introduce all a whole new repertoire uh, in the places that I've been. And that served well so that I could use the choir at times to educate, to bring on board, you know, to, to, um, to, to educate a congregation, again, used in the same kind of respectful way that Benny was talking about, uh, about the, the plethora of different ways we can be inspired during services. Um, so I found that to be accepted wherever I've been, and equally in the UK and in, in Canada at this point, and also uh, I've had the choir in the United States as well. Um, but some of the differences, you know, trope, some of the tropes are, are similar, some of them are quite different. Um, uh, so Torah trope, for example, just I'll give you one off, uh, some uh, of one trope, you know, in the UK, and in the US and Canada, so not so far off, but just that little bit of difference. You know, the double pashta uh, uh, in the UK has, a, has a, its own melody compared to a, a, a double pashta in North America, where really that double pashta is just there to give you the, the show you the actual accent of, this, of the word. Um, when the trope is supposed to hang off the end of the word and not be very helpful otherwise. Um, you know, we have uh, the haftara, you have very, very different leap motifs, but similar modes, you know. Um, so, you know, the, from that perspective, and nusach is, nusach was largely the same. Uh, and I don't mean nusach anglia, because that's a term that, of, a term of endearment for the collection of uh, the musical traditions, including the, the melodies, the, you know, the, the, the British Blue Book and, uh, and other local uh, favorite melodies and, and modes and so forth. But the, you know, the, the Nusach is the same. We have Hashem Allah, we have Arav, Ava, Ahav, Arava, we have Fregish, Rike, Pentatonix, Lichot, and the range. So those are all the same, um, which actually made the transition for me super easy. But coming to England, remember my, all my training is British. You know, I grew up singing in the synagogue choir in, uh, at the Shar Shemaim in Montreal with Stephen and- uh, Very, all, very British. Very, very British, the British synagogue in Montreal. And then Steve Robbins taught me even while I was, you know, on, in North America, that's all British. And, and, you know, so those elements, I mean, this is the point of Nusach, right? Is that no matter where you go in the world, you can feel at home. And that was super meaningful and, and made it all possible. Um, you know, <laughs> it's funny. One of the things that, that stands out in my mind, and it's a silly thing, but I teach B'nai Mitzvah students. I've taught B'nai Mitzvah students everywhere where I've been. And I have a collection, a folder on my computer of MP3s that I use to teach students, um, which span, the collection spans my career at this point. And, you know, and there are several, there are slightly different melodies everywhere I've been, like the Brachot after the Haftarah, you know, uh, in Canada, there's this this little melody in there that the congregation likes to sing. It doesn't happen in the UK or in the United States. So I have, in addition to, you know, slightly, uh, in addition to files at three different pitches and two different speeds, I have versions for the UK, the USA, and Canada as well. So I, it's my experience on both sides of the pond is really part of my identity that way. Um, I, I, I promise that I, that, um, you know, to Russell that I would get a little bit into some of the, the fun vocabulary differences that I, um, you know, that I, that I worked with. So, you know, a warden in the UK is a gabai or parnas or even an usher in North America. Um, in the UK, it's a baby blessing. It's a baby naming on this side of the pond. Buggies are strollers. Stone settings are unveilings. Uh, chazan in the UK is spelled with one Z and in the US with two Zs. So, you know, there's, there's that as well. Um, a chazan sheni or a sextant over there on your side of the pond, uh, Russell, is a balkore over here. Um, when you say shul in the UK, my experience was that meant the sanctuary specifically, uh, whereas over here it's the building. <laughs> um, program is a program, just depends on how many M's you want to include in that. And um, you might say over there, would you like some wine? And I would say, would you like some wine? So, you know, <laughs> there's those vocabulary things as well, the, the in inflections and intonations. And 
I, I'm being a little bit flippant in this very serious session, but you know what? That was a piece of how I connected with my congregation. You know, those differences, the, the learning opportunities, the mistakes we make when, you know, we talk about our pants and our, you know, uh, and our underwear. Um, you know, those are important pieces of connections with our congregation. Um, you know, at the Kiddish, you guys have egg mayo. I had no idea what that was. It was egg salad. Um, <laughs> gefilte fish is fried fish balls over there. We don't even have that over here. It's, you know, it's a log or a blob. Um, goujons, we don't eat cold fried fish in North America. Um, and thank God, scotch is scotch. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, your your um, discussion of the, discu uh, the difference between Eastern and Western Ashkenazic in the, in the uh, learning is interesting. Um, we were at one of our cantors conventions, I think it was the one in Prague, uh, and, and I, I, was, I was learning and, and um, uh, Gideon Zelemai, who of course is, is the Chazan at, well, one Z or two, uh, at Shah Shemayim, uh, asked me, he said, I'd never heard it done that way before. What's that? You know, what is it, etc. And then he asked me to, um, because it was the, his is the British shul, uh, he asked me to record it for him, the trop for him, so he could teach British in Shah Shemayim. So very, very interesting. Which indeed they do for Haftarah, yes. Yeah. Not for Torah, interestingly. Interesting. So, so Gershon, you presumably learnt your Nusach and your modes and tropes at, at HUC, which of course is in, um, is in uh, New York or, or certainly in the US. Um, I did. How and, have you uh, seen the difference? I have, well, there's many differences. Uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to uh, Ben Steinberg, the uh, longtime now retired music director at uh, Temple Sinai in Toronto. And uh, working with Ben was amazing. Uh, ben grew up in a cantorial household, as many of you will know. And um, uh, so what we did there, it was not, interestingly, it was not cantorial improvisation, but it sounded like cantorial improvisation. It was a snapshot of what a, uh, of what a good but not genius chazan would do, because a genius chazan never does it the same twice. Um, uh, what a good chazan would do in the service, and there would be a little bit of a, uh, something that if you understood chazanut at all, you could make out what he intended. If you didn't, and here in the UK, we, we hear some of Ben Seinberg's music, but you don't hear the, uh, the chazanus element at all because the excellent musicians that we, uh, that we have just don't know the sound of that in progressive Judaism, I have to say. I don't I'm not involved in very much in the um, uh, Masorti or uh, United Synagogue Orthodox uh, world here. So I know there's a whole different musical fabric there. I want to say that, um, first of all, there is that difference between the, uh, and, and I think it's worthwhile for the UK to preserve the Western Ashkenazi uh, uh, trope and um, uh, Victor Tunkel has, uh, was a, a great a proponent of it and has written a book that people should read uh, and, uh, and to learn the, that, the, that trope. Uh, so it would be the difference between, and the, some of you who are more scholarly about this than I might very well want to correct me on this, but so for instance, um, uh, the, in the US you'll hear in a reform synagogue something like this, yeah. And here you'll hear So it's just different enough to mix you up completely. Uh, and when I'm teaching B'nai Mitzvah, uh, I, I often won't give them an example because I, I just got lazy. I was, uh, the, the, the luxury of serving small communities which I did for the, for 10 years until coming to West London Synagogue uh, about a year ago, was that I could do whatever I wanted and they basically loved it. You know, whatever you do, they're happy you're there. Um, I do want to say that um, the, again, I'm speaking entirely of the progressive community, the progressive Jewish community, mostly the flagship congregations are uh, uh, organ and choir dominated. And West London Synagogue, which in many respects is the flagship congregation, has had a fabulous organist for years who has written some of the music that we hear. He is not Jewish, although uh, he's very devoted to the traditions of the synagogue. Um, and uh, much of the uh, music of the synagogue was written by the non-Jewish organists dating back 
several hundred, well, uh, 180 years now uh, is the, the, the origins of the, um, <laughs> somebody just asked me to sing Shalom Rob, <laughs> Ben Steinberg's wonderful piece. It is done here, uh, in fact, but again, without the uh, character that, that, uh, that he baked into it. Um, so uh, West London Synagogue still does this very organ and choir based music and people love it. They don't, as far as I can tell, they don't sing along. Um, but uh, although it's been hard to tell because since I've been here, we've been um, in the various forms of lockdown. But I do want to say that two things. One is that West London Synagogue also introduced um, about 10 years ago something they call the Shira service, which is a way of appealing to the uh, desire for more participatory music in the synagogue. Um, the current, um, what they call her the um, uh, community singer, uh, Maya Levy is her name, and she's an, a wonderfully, wonderfully talented and versatile singer um, who would be called Cantor in any uh, U.S. reform congregation. Um, uh, and they, they do the kinds of things that people can sing with. Um, there are, when I arrived in 2011, there was one cantor, uh, one credentialed cantor in the uh, progressive movement, uh, cantor Zoe Jacobs. Mm -hmm. We now have four, if you count me, um, uh, which includes Sarah Grabiner and uh, Tamara Wolfson. Oh, Wilson, yeah. And um, they basically brought the new version of HUC, not the HUC that uh, School of Sacred Music that I went to, but the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music, and that's not a joke, that's what the name was changed to that. Um, uh, and they uh, are devoted to the guitar toten, and I say it with some degree of, I mean, it's not my cup of tea exactly, although I can do it. Um, and Debbie Friedman is a wonder, was a wonderful songwriter, as we know. Uh, but uh, the uh, it's interesting that both Zoe and Sarah are British born, but devoted to a kind of an American style of progressive Jewish music. And I'm American born and I want to preserve a lot of the traditions that are here, both in terms of Nusach, such as it exists, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, Torah trope that is uh, found more virtually exclusively in the United Kingdom, uh, I think it's worth keeping. Um, and uh, Daniel Tunkel has uh, posted something on the uh, chat, which uh, I urge you to look at, um, because I think that this is a unique and wonderful uh, Jewish musical culture that is virtually unknown. Even Ben Steinberg did not know most of the music that I encountered when I first came to the UK uh, on sabbatical. Really interesting. And uh, incidentally, another plug for July the 1st, um, I am uh, interviewing both Zoe Jacobs and Tamara Wolfson. They are, yes, I saw they were going to be the last in the series with, with Jackie Chernet. And uh, we'll have a couple of other a uh, couple of other people and, uh, on, on that. So that, that's really interesting that you want to preserve the UK tradition. And I am biased, uh, obviously, but I, I think Western Ashkenazic learning is absolutely fantastic. And uh, the only other place I've heard it actually um, is in Germany, which is where I think it, it originally uh, it originally hails from. Um, Benny, um, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, a, a, another question in a minute, but I, I'm, I've got a, question, a couple of questions in the chat that want to know about your time in Cardiff. They want to know, were, were, you, were you in Cardiff at some stage? So I was not in Cardiff, but my uh, grandfather and great-grandfather were both rabbis in Cardiff, starting from, uh, I believe, 39 till 88. So that's the association with Cardiff. But I personally have only visited Cardiff a few times. Okay, so that's, uh, that, 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 that will have put uh, Gillian Brauner to, uh, to write on that one. So, but thank you for your question there. The question I want to ask you um, uh, relates to, to the, we've heard about the difference in, in traditions. Um, do, do you feel as a, well, firstly, do you feel a British cantor now that you've been in the US for quite some time? And do you feel that you have an opportunity to bring the kind of British traditionalism that we've actually heard uh, Gershon talk about into Park East and into Manhattan? Um, so I, yeah, I have a somewhat of a mixed a uh, answer. I think I've been here for so long, as you hear from my accent, that I somewhat dropped the traditional either Mancunian or Liverpudlian accent, which I know that you all miss so desperately. We do. Um, 
but uh, but I do think that n- even not so much in the music, but more in the formality with which I like to envision my tefillot in the idea that I plan things in advance musically. Uh, in 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 the way you know, I've seen colleagues of mine that are cantors walk into shul without a tie, and you know, maybe some people on this group think that that's okay, but it's not how I grew up. And I think when you're a shliach tzibur, you know, you're you're people are looking up to you, and there's a certain there's a certain elegance and there's a certain way about you when you're standing certainly at the at the front on the bima. So I would say that I try to keep the best of the traditions of the UK, even if they're not solely related to its music, but more to the character of what a chazan or a baltfila, which by the way, I fancy myself more a chazanish baltfila, which is the hybrid. It's not the world-class chazan and it's not the simple baltfila, but that's what I think I am. So, and I hope that the congregation might agree. So that's, uh, that's how I would address your question. Mm, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, I, I don't want to drift too much um, away from our, our, our time here. Um, and I'm going to uh, open the, the floor, as it were, a uh, very virtual floor to, to some of the questions. Um, uh, I'll give a plug. I will give a plug um, for uh, Daniel Tonkel's session, which is on Who Needs a Shul Choir in June. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. H- Howard Cohen says there appears to be a big difference in the UK between the provinces and London. London seems to have dropped Chazanot the most from, for most of its shuls. The congregation just want to get away as soon as they can while keeping Chazanot for concerts. I'm going to ask you, Benny, again, that, that, that question is applied to your shul. So I've been in your shul. It's a very traditional shul. I can see that it, it, it is on the one hand one that absolutely appreciates um, choirs and formal music, but I, I suspect also um, that they may also want to get away as soon as they can while keeping Chazanot for some of the excellent concerts that, that you put on. What was your view on that? So, you know, I think there's a mix. I like the line that we have in the Musaf Davning, Toamer Chaim Zahu. Those who, who taste it, we say about Shabbos, are guaranteed a, a good, a long life. I think that people want Chazanut. They obviously want to hear the traditional Chazanut, but they also want to get out. So there, there's, there is this uh, duality. And I think, by the way, a good chazan, I always say this to students who come to me. I said, you have to plan your service and you have to have plan A and plan B. I don't know if they use ways in England, but certainly here when, they're, when you're traveling and there's traffic, it always gives you an alternate route. A good chazan, baltfilash, liach tibur, however you refer to them, has to have a way to also bring you the tradition, whether it's chazanut and nusach, but also have to have other options in the tefillah. Okay, no, thank you. Um, I can see that you're, you're, mo- you're, you're on the move already. So uh, uh, I'm hoping that you're keeping your eyes on the road as well as looking at us. That's all right. <laughs> I'm not driving myself. <laughs> oh, no, of course. The, your, your, your steering wheel is on the wrong side over there in, uh, in Manhattan, isn't it? Um, Jason, can I, can I ask you that, that same question about whether people want to get out of shul in your view um, or, or whether actually they do appreciate music or it's a balance? So I think it's a balance, but our, our synagogue, uh, you know, our members don't have watches. So, um, no, uh, but in seriousness, we take care to make sure that <laughs> we take care to make sure that um, we are uh, keep the, the pace of the service going and we're finishing at a reasonable time. Um, certainly during the pandemic, uh, we've, we've learned to be even more careful about that uh, because of the Zitzfleisch zitz required. Um, but uh, it's not, it's not a matter of the, the, the end of the service. And I don't think people are running away. Um, we, I think we have um, a great uh, understanding and familiarity with, with the mix of things that I do in particular, that the synagogue has done historically. Um, I try and do things uh, in a most familiar way possible. My congregation kind of gives me like, the opportunity to do one thing different than a standard service, uh, kind of each week, uh, introducing new pieces is uh, is a, is a slow process, and and uh, if I do it too quickly, I hear about it. Um, but there is an openness to the different flavors. You know, uh, I do light chazanut, not heavy, um, from time to time in a in a piece or prayer or whatever it is. Um, the choir sings under normal circumstances, uh, kind of once a month. Um, which gives that that opportunity to experience uh, the service in a little bit of a different way, but still participatory. Um, I don't feel like they're running away, and certainly we have kiddush afterwards, uh, or we used to. Um, 
And that is a huge piece of uh, communal, communal connection. Um, but uh, no, we're, we're, not, we're not rushing to get out, but the pace has to be right. You know, the pace of the service and how it, not necessarily how much of one type of singing you're doing or how long the Torah reading is. That can be forgiven if there's a longer day or whatever, as long as the pace is right. Well, you got a thumbs up from Agnes Klein, who I know is a member of your congregation. So uh, uh, the checks in the mail, Agnes. Um, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Now, um, I, I can see that Alex Klein keeps throwing questions uh, that are off topic here, but nevertheless, <laughs> I'm going to take the one that Gershon has said that he will answer, which is a question to Gershon to explain the difference between Debbie, that's Debbie Friedman, uh, and tradition. I think this is a reference to when you were saying that the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music, uh, as it is today, was different from the tradition uh, that you have. Uh, he's also asked, um, do you sing Beth Stars and Murph Finkelstein as well? So Gershon, what's the answer to that? So there's a whole story here, which I have done some writing about what I call the revolution in North American uh, uh, Jewish music in the 1990s. Uh, and it really felt revolutionary and people were angry at each other all the time. Uh, when that was translated to the British scene, uh, it was much calmer. Uh, so we don't get the sense that if you do Debbie Friedman, uh, you're a disgrace, a disgrace to Jewish music. It's just, oh, that's interesting. Um, in, again, in progressive, uh, in the progressive world, which I've been in. Um, Beth Stiles, I, I, I confess ignorance there. I don't know her work at all, but we do at West London Cynic. I know I, I'm, I should be embarrassed to be a graduate of the Debbie Friedman School. Um, but uh, uh, at West London Synagogue, we do Mayor Finkelstein, who's very uh, fits very well into the uh, choral tradition. That really works. Uh, we don't do a lot, at least as far as I've experienced so far. But he's present. Um, so it's hard to know where to pick this up from uh, uh, exactly. But I will say that in um, uh, I served as the cantor for one year following the uh, when um, uh, Jeff Klepper left Beth Emmett Synagogue in Evanston. And I discovered that they were as orthodox in their loyalty to his style of guitar led, uh, um, well, whatever term you use kind of places you in the politics of it, guitar led ditties or guitar led folk music or whatever. Uh, people really were bent out of shape if they didn't hear the pieces that that he had brought to them. Um, so, I mean, Debbie Friedman uh, has completely taken over the Havdalah service everywhere I have been. Uh, I try to put in some other things that people will hear, you know, a little bit of chanting at the beginning, uh, you know, I don't know what my uh, British Reform congregants think about that. They sometimes say, oh, I haven't heard that in years. Um, and I don't conclude Havdalah with her tune. I conclude with something that's more Nusach based. Um, so, uh, but a lot of my experience here is, you know, when I arrived, I started serving liberal congregations almost immediately. I didn't know the music, so I did what I knew. So I don't actually know a lot of the music from the Blue Book, for instance. Uh, which everybody else is familiar with. I've had to teach myself some of it. Uh, and now, of course, I don't really have musical responsibilities at West London Synagogue. That's not my, my remit there. Um, hmm. uh, I think there's a... Uh, the way you define tradition is different in the British setting. And it's also, at the, somebody mentioned this earlier, there's a big difference between what goes on in London's flagship synagogues and out in the uh, smaller communities that I served, Lincolnshire, uh, Stevenage, places that have maybe 20, 30, 40 members. The biggest community that I served over 10 years was in Norwich with 60 members. So uh, the resources available were much smaller. I think I'm going to shut up now because I realize I'm not making any points. I'm just talking to hear my own voice, and that's never a good. These idea. are always these are all interesting points. I, I, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, incidentally, we could. I know we could go on all night about slightly slightly off topic subjects, um, such as whether you know whether Debbie Friedman's Have Dollar is in fact sung throughout the world, and many people don't realize it's Debbie Friedman's um, Have Dollar, etc. Um, but I, I know that Benny can only stay with us for so long, and I, if Benny is is still with us, I'm, I'm kind of testing whether Benny is still with us. 
I can see that he's he's still logged on because I, I I did have yeah he's having some okay he's having some reception issues and we'll try and come back on, on camera um, uh, as soon as possible. So um, in the interim, um, Jason, I'm going to ask you, you. You mentioned earlier uh, this 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 kind of. Um, issue that you had about you know people want to get out of shul but you but you stick on the clock etc have you found that that sticking to the clock is different in the uk than it is in the us do you find that there is more or less tolerance of congregations in the uk versus the us for length of service or indeed pace which of course is a separate issue Interesting question. I think my perspective uh, and my experience leads me to an answer that's not going to be very interesting. I have been um, granted freedom of the bima in in both, you know, both sides of the pond, and I kind of set that pace based on, you know, my uh, feeling of what works best and the feedback that I get from my congregation. So I think I, I've had similar experiences on either side of the pond because I was the one sort of. Uh, in charge of, or at least uh, getting a large say in, uh, and perhaps because my colleagues and I agreed, I think that's a big piece of it as well. Um, I, and also the services I've, I've been leading have been very similar. To answer actually your, your last question a little bit better than I did, you know, uh, do I bring my, my UK melodies into my services here in Canada at this point, but in the United States as well, when I was there. Absolutely. Um, it, there's something to be said for the, the, um, the, the pomp and circumstance of like, versus, you know, it's not bad. But there's something that just, to me, I just need a, a, a zets from, from the blue book for the, of course, I'm doing a whole bunch of choral pieces um, that, you know, were informed by my experiences at the Shara Shemaim and, um, and in much of my, uh, you know, uh, experience in at New London Synagogue where um, my training was naturally accepted there. Um, how is it received here? I mean, again, it goes along with the idea of that's not the piece of music I grew up with is very, very important to congregants in North America. Very, very important. Um, and so you have to take great care to um, share in advance, to teach, to share, you know, to, to spend time on a melody. Uh, when you do a new piece, don't do it once every quarter, do it four weeks in a row so that it becomes familiar. And nobody who comes just once a month or less often can say, you know, you only ever do these pieces. So you're giving them like an opportunity. Um, I like thinking of it as, you know, similar to walking into a, a restaurant in North America, a diner kind of thing, you know, where um, you, the menu is enormous, but you walk into your restaurant every morning and you have your bowl of oatmeal or porridge. Um, and, um, and that's your breakfast every day, every day of your year, every day of your life. But I come in and I drop some chocolate chips into the porridge and I say, try this, you know? And some people will say, ugh, I can't eat this, it's a different food. And some people will say, mm, okay, like Debbie Friedman, interesting. Uh, and some people, people will say, I love chocolate chips. This is fantastic, I've never heard it. I've never tasted chocolate chips like this before. So my, my idea is if you bring melodies that are meaningful to you and that you can translate with emotion and get the meanings of the prayers across in your davening, you will transport the congregation. Um, one of my mentors, um, uh, Yada Rebling, uh, who's uh, in, in, in Germany, you know, um, gave over this wonderful analogy that the cantor, the chazan is supposed to, oops, sorry, is supposed to be like an angel with wings and you have to somehow, even though you're facing the ark, your wings have to come up from behind you and scoop the whole congregation along and, and carry them. <laughs> and I love that image. And that's what I try and do every Shabbat, every holiday service that I do is infused with tradition and an opportunity for experiencing something different. And, um, you know, appealing to old, young, choral supporters, Chazanut supporters, Nusach supporters, it's all got to be in there. And again, you know, I think that's what's, that's what keeps the pace going. That's what keeps the congregants um, 
connected and, and hopefully connecting with, with Hashem. Thank you. Norm Firkin, who I think is another one of your congregants, tells us that, in fact, and when the congregation stops singing, you've, you've, you've sung enough. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And, and, he'll, and he'll attest to the fact that when I hear the congregation stop singing, even sometimes in the middle of a piece, I'll change to the melody. Actually, I'm going to take moderate, moderator's privilege for 30 seconds to ask you, I, I, who actually composed that second Havul Hashem? Havul Hashem, this guy, This guy named Traditional. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I, do a lot of I think the expression is teku. Teku, right. like it's a Hebrew acronym that means only the Lord only knows. Yeah, got you, got you. Okay, um, I'm conscious that we're we're coming. Up to the, <clears throat> I'm conscious we're coming up to the hour. <clears throat> we will go over the hour for those people who want to. So don't, don't worry about that. And I'll take uh, happy to take some of the off-topic comments that um, uh, some of you have put in the chat. That's absolutely fine. And I'll even take one from Howard Cohen, who's been very prolific um, in the chat. But I want to ask the two of you, and if Benny's listening as well, um, I, I just kind of have a, a one-line answer to. Uh, this question, which is, if you had the choice of being in the UK uh, or the US for the rest of your career, which of those places, or, or North America, which of those places would you Thank choose? Thank you. <laughs> Gershon, which, which would you choose? Would you choose Canada? Would you choose the UK or, or possibly even Chicago? <laughs> well, I'll insult everybody, but uh, uh, for me, just my, my career is, is here. My life is here. Uh, in the UK. I'm very happy to stay for all kinds of reasons. Um, and I have come to love the somewhat less divisive, less dramatic approach to Jewish life that I encounter in the communities that I'm in. There might be enormous battles going on elsewhere that I don't know about. And some of you that are in either uh, United Synagogue or Masorti might say to me, well, you don't know what's really going on. And I don't. It's true. But uh, I'm very happy to stay here uh, for the rest of my uh, career. Thank you. Jason, what would you say? Uh, so um, that's a really tricky question. Let me actually divert <laughs> yes, the it is. question. Um, was my choir at New London Mixed? Yes, it was. Um, thank you very much for your, um, for your compliments on the Zoom choir. That's actually one of the things that's um, really, really uh, helped keep the community together here in, in Ottawa as we do these um, we do these, uh, it's not Zoom choir, but it's, it's um, digitally edited, um, you know, uh, virtual choirs. It's um, the mainstay of how we, how we do uh, prayer together here safely. Um, so at the risk of being cliche, you know, home is where the minion is. Um, <laughs> I incredibly enjoyed my experience in London. It was fantastic. The people, the the learning experiences, you know, having my first bar mitzvah student, you know, the week I arrived and realizing, oh my goodness, I have eight hours to learn how to do, um, you know, uh, British Torah trope. So, um, you know, it opened my eye, my eyes, my mind, the opportunities to work with my um, my British and European colleagues, lifelong friends of mine now, and and many of you are here today. Um, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, I am from Canada, and I think that uh, really was a, a uh, deciding factor in, in coming back here. And I'm incredibly pleased that I did. I am having uh, an amazing experience here at my, in my community with, uh, as I was telling uh, Russell before we got started, uh, it's close to where I grew up. And so I'm teaching many of my high school friends, B'nai Mitzvah kids. Mm -hmm. um, which is an incredible thing. It, the, the connect, the family is is nearby. We're all my entire side of the family is is in, is in Ontario. My parents are on the call, and uh, you know Stephen Glass is 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 in Ontario. Like this is this is home, uh, and I'm proud of it, and I'm happy. I just signed a renewal contract with my synagogue for a further five years. Hazel 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 Hazel. Hazel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, uh, but uh, but the UK is absolutely part of me. Ask any of my congregants. Um, and I, I just am glad that I've had these world experiences. That's great. And if Benny's still with us, I think we may have lost Benny. I don't know. I'll ask Benny the same question. But I think we may have 
possibly lost Benny. I do know that Benny could only do the hour and the, I do know that Benny actually squeezed us in to do that, which were, uh, for, to do what he's done. So uh, we were very grateful for that. Now we've come up to the hour. So um, the formal part around crossing the pond. Uh, thank you very much for those comments, some really insightful, um, insightful comments there, and we will take the best of those um, and uh, we will preserve them in the usual way. Um, if the two of you, Gershon and Jason, are happy to stay on for a little bit longer, um, then uh, we will uh, take some of the more wider questions that uh, that people have been um, have been asking and um uh, obviously, for those of you that are tuning in uh, over the hour, if you uh, need to drop off, then obviously uh, we, we understand that, um, in which case this is the point at which I should just say that this is a series that takes place now every fortnight. Um, we've made a special concession west of the Azores, uh, in other words, in Israel, the UK, uh, South Africa, etc., uh, to adjust the special timing that the US gave us at the weekend when your clocks went forward and ours didn't. Uh, so future sessions will all be at 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m. Uh, in the UK, Europe, Israel and South Africa, respectively, and uh, at remaining at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And for people like Mark Kligman, whom I noticed is on as well, um, you can take three hours uh, off that to be uh, to be earlier in the morning. But this is every fortnight. Uh, our next one is Passover in the pandemic, uh, and uh, uh, we will be putting the relevant publicity out for that. So uh, thank you. Thank you for that. So um, thank you for uh, agreeing to, to stay on. Um, and uh, this is a question from Geraldine Orbach, who is one of our doyens. Uh, she wants to know, uh, could we know how, how many congregants in each of our panelists regularly came to Shabbos services before the pandemic and listen in during the pandemic? Jason. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Um, so, Norm, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think on it ranges on a regular Shabbat with nothing special going on from around 80 to 100 congregants. Uh, if we have a bar bat mitzvah, that can easily go up to 300 and fill the sanctuary. Uh, our, our main sanctuary holds 330 people in regular pews. Our, our social hall is behind the sanctuary and with a, a wall opened up, we can seat a thousand people in, in the space. Um, so um, yeah, it, it, it's still, it, you know, it, it feels full because people sit in sections or used to sit in sections like close together and we have extra seating on the sides that are closer to the beam and face inwards and so forth. So um, there's, a, there's a choice for people to sit, but we, we generally, uh, like the whoosh of sound when people sang along is, is wonderful and I miss it immensely. Mm. Gershon? Well, I started at West London Synagogue uh, when the uh, uh, plague had already begun. Uh, so I don't really know from experience what the place, uh, you know, what the sanctuary looks like when in uh, regular Shabbatot. Uh, over the course of the pandemic, we've had attendance that's gone way past what people expected at times when we've been able to track it. Um, uh, we've had uh, uh, over Hanukkah, our, uh, one of our, we have two co-senior rabbis, uh, Rabbi David Mitchell and Rabbi Helen Freeman. And David is very uh, creative and he put together some wonderful programming all through Hanukkah. And we engaged with over 1500 uh, congregants uh, uh, during that period at one time or another of the 3000 that is the size of the shul uh, uh, altogether. Wow. So uh, that was pretty impressive. And by and large, people have really, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of people who are not crazy about driving at night who don't show up to a Friday night service who are going to be very happy to do it by Zoom. And I think that's, although people aren't asking this question so far, but I think everybody is thinking about it, what's going to happen as things open up? We are now able to have 30 people in a sanctuary that holds about 1,000. We have 30. Uh, and uh, the those people who we've drawn into our orbit through the uh, capacities of Zoom and streaming and so forth, um, we can't abandon them now, is my thinking. Uh, for instance, we have something called Shabbat Tots. You all have some version of it uh, on Shabbat morning where we do all kinds of <clears throat> cute things for little kids. But some of the families that come in uh, come in from uh, a, a town near Amsterdam. I've got somebody from there. I've got somebody from Oxford. 
Uh, and even people, those of you that have, some, uh, have or had had small children, you know that packing them up to go to shul at, uh, you know, on Shabbat morning is a chore. And to be able to just, you know, uh, leave them with their whatever it is they're munching on and do it by, via Zoom is really attractive. So I think that we're going to be doing some version of a hybridization uh, over the uh, uh, coming months as things open up. Thank you. I can see Kanta Benny has rejoined us. Uh, uh, Benny, I know you need. I know you need to get off, uh, but uh, we obviously just wanted to uh, thank you for that. Uh, do you have time for one question, or do you, do you need to? Yes, go? sure. Uh, sure. We were just um, we, we were just asking uh, how many congregants uh, were coming to Shabbos services before the pandemic and what the situation is now uh, in your shul. Obviously, you, you're not doing live streaming or anything like that, but what is the situation now? So before the pandemic, on a regular Shabbos, we used to have anywhere from two to three hundred people if there wasn't a simcha. Uh, obviously, during the pandemic, we were closed and then we, we reopened with about a 75 person capacity. But it's interesting that you ask me this question now because this past Shabbos, we had the most people since the beginning of the pandemic, and that was 80 people. And 80 people in a sanctuary that could hold a thousand never felt so good. So <laughs> we're certainly, you know, we're feeling very hopeful. And every new person or old new that comes back, we feel like, okay, we have another milestone, another achievement. So we're crawling back, but we're determined to get there. So, uh, thank you. Howard Cohen, who's asked a number of questions, and I'm going to voice this particular one, which is linked to this. Did the panel think that the situation will be the same after lockdown's finish? Uh, in other words, after we've, got, after we've all gone back, and let's say the pandemic is, is now, thankfully, hopefully behind us, do, do we think that the situation in terms of attendance and, and the way in which we have maybe connected with our communities um, over the pandemic, do you, do you think that's changed for, forever, or will we go back to uh, as we were before, Benny? You know, it's a tough question to answer. But what I can tell you is that I do hope from what I see reading the tea leaves, that more and more people will come back. And I want to believe, though maybe naively so, that prayer has become more meaningful to people. You know, I was doing Mavarach HaMachodesh last week, and I, I'm, I'm my own best critic. I didn't think I had the best Shabbos, but I saw a lot, a lot of people cry. And I don't necessarily attribute that to my singing, but more to the emotion of being able to come back to a sanctuary see your friends, pray, say Chaim Shel Tova. And by the way, I repeated it many times because I wanted to make the impression, um, the musical impression that is. So I would say that I am hopeful. Okay, thank you. Jason, what do you think? I, uh, I have a very similar view. I very much hope that the, um, the emotional piece, that the connection that's missing um, will come back. Uh, I think it's gonna be a transition, not a light switch. Um, and you know perhaps rightly so i think there's there's members of the community that that need to feel this out more slowly and some that are already back with us we i we have the capacity during this phase of our uh, of our you know city's lockdown level of having 20 or 35 and well we can have up to a third in our space uh but we don't touch that with the 10 foot pole we have 30 we have 25 in our space right now um and there is, I don't know, I mean, like, I can't remember which of this material I discussed with uh, our team before we started, but um, we are live streaming our services in as, as well as, um, as doing it in person as long as we can, uh, done in as kosher a way as that's doable, uh, such that our, you know, camera and our microphone are kind of under lock and key and don't move and don't change settings and it, our live stream is turned on before Shabbat and ends uh, automatically afterwards. Um, so the value of that being, you know, right now, anyone who is not comfortable coming into the synagogue can, can benefit, but also after the pandemic is over, whatever that means, um, those who are homebound or otherwise not able, able to come to synagogue can have those connections and I can't see turning away those people and, and so forth. Uh, but we do things here in a very specific way that is um, when our sanctuary is essentially empty, we very much tune our programs and our services 
at that uh, virtual uh, congregation. We do it very specifically. We don't pretend we're not really doing it online and just pretend we're talking to people in the sanctuary. So people feel it's Hamish. Um, I wonder what, I, I wonder with some hope that there will be more people coming back, whether that is uh, a replacement and that will be damaging to the greater uh, sense of community connection. Um, but I hope that we will continue to be very smart about how we um, how we connect with and ab appear to be connecting with our congregation. No, thank you. I Gersh don't know the answer. No, no, thank you for that. Gershon, what, what, what do you think the score is over at West London? I, I think we've done a lot to maintain and enrich the connections. And um, uh, it's hard to know. So, so much, so much of it is demographic, uh, that things that we don't really have control over, the decline of certain kind of religious observance, which has particularly affected the progressive communities. Uh, the, um, I think that this thing that I was talking about, that hybridization of the presentation of services and other programs is going to have uh, an, a big, make, going to make a big difference what it will be, I'm certainly not a prognosticator, and the people who are good at prognosticating never get it right either. So we will just see what happens. I think that's all we can do. But we have done a great deal to um, engage our community in new ways. And I uh, will that create a new cohort of people who will attend in different ways? I'd like to think so. Yeah, I think so. But we also noticed and I was very aware of it, uh, that at the first service where the organ played live in the sanctuary and the choir, we had a choir of four socially distanced, professional singers though, they sound like, you know, 15 of non-professional singers, um, 16, what I, um, th uh, the sound was so, it was, it, it was just amazing to hear. I don't need to tell you those that are musical, which is pretty much everybody on this, on this Zoom, that it just was transforming to hear it. And uh, so I think when people come back, they're gonna remember why they like coming to Shul. Uh, at the same time, those that have very good reasons like problems driving at night and so forth, um, will uh, uh, still have an access that is meaningful to them. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Canterbury still with us, so we're lucky here. Um, I've got a question from Evelyn Green, Canterbury. When did you come to South Africa and attend a service with the late Cantor Johnny Gluck at the Great Synagogue? And I'm going to ask, actually ask Benny to unmute because I, I had to mute him in the middle. So. Um, I think it was um, the end of 79, beginning of 80, and we were in South Africa till 84, 85. Um, I remember I was about six or seven years old the first time I heard him. Thank you. And while you're on, I'm going to ask you the next question that's come from Geraldine. Is there more autonomy, in your view, for the Chazan in the UK or in North America? Are we talking about the, the liturgy, the Nusach, the, uh, I, I assume, how you conduct a service? If that's the, the question, I would say there's definitely more autonomy in the US but I don't know that that's necessarily a blessing. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, Jay, Jason, what would you say? Um, interesting. I mean, I think in, when I was in the UK, the, there was such a huge focus on Nusach Anglia. Uh, so I, I think I, I was... I think I was constricted to mostly Nusach Anglia, whatever that means, you know, in terms of the, the melodies and, 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 and traditional Nusach and so forth. Um, and here I have less, uh, I have less autonomy in the sense of familiar tunes. So I think I could do whatever I wanted in, in the UK, as long as it was mostly within Nusach Anglia. Here I can do whatever I want as long as it's mostly within what the congregation has been doing for 30, 40, 50 years. You know, if you know what your congregation likes and you're connected with that, then everyone's happy, <laughs> including me. I'm sure Norm Firkin and also Mark Max will agree to that. Uh, they, they've been posting nice comments um, uh, while we've been on. So uh, thank, thank you for that. Uh, thank you. And um, Gershon, uh, 
What, what, what do you think? Do you think there's more autonomy for the Chazan in the UK or North America? That's, I can't speak to a, a generally to it. In my uh, small communities, I could do whatever I want. Uh, and, and I cordially miss it. Um, I'm functioning, as, as you know, as a rabbi, not a cantor in, uh, at West London Synagogue, uh, but it is a much more choreographed uh, presentation. Uh, and the challenge there is doing what everybody else has been doing for years while looking like you're making it up on the spot. Um, uh, but my, in my small communities, I could do whatever I wanted. Um, and it was only my own creativity that was the, the limitation there. Um, and that's, it's just a very uh, idiosyncratic view of the situation. I, I, I don't, I think by and large, uh, British institutions are a little more structured and certainly in North America, there is a sense that, uh, you know, of, of, of freedom uh, is prized, but it doesn't always give you what you think it's going to. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Well, we've been going for um, 80 minutes and I'm conscious that our, our panelists um, uh, just signed up for the hour. So uh, we, we appreciate that. Um, I, I am going to ask the final question. Incidentally, but Benny has put in the chat. Thank you, one and all. This is fabulous. Chag Sameach and music fill our hearts always. Uh, and I just want to say thank you again uh, to Benny for, for, um, for looking in. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to voice the last question. It, it's completely off topic, but he's allowed to do it because he's the director of uh, ECA. Alex Klein um, asks, do you think the pandemic has brought down barriers that existed between the various branches of Judaism? And will this make a difference um, after uh, the pandemic. And just before you answer that, I'll just ask, answer Rachel Weston to say it is possible. We will be, we will be making the recording available um, afterwards. I'll say a little bit about that uh, later. So yes, um, Gershon, do, do, do you think that the barriers that existed before the pandemic, uh, if there were any, um, will have been um, uh, brought down or, or reduced afterwards? Mm. <clears throat> the main differences, uh, uh, the main um, uh, barriers, if that's the right word that, uh, that I'm aware of, are between, ironically, the two progressive movements here, liberal Judaism and uh, the movement for reform Judaism, uh, which have already been in talks and creating uh, institutional frameworks for more cooperation. Uh, for those that are uh, North America based, we have two completely independent uh, progressive movements in this country, which is strange, but they have very different institutional histories. <clears throat> so we've been uh, collaborating more with our more or less sister <clears throat> flagship congregation in the liberal movement, the liberal Jewish synagogue. And uh, for a variety of reasons, that's going to continue, not just because of the uh, effect of the pandemic, although that's part of it, but also because my rabbinic classmate Igor Zinkoff is at the uh, liberal Jewish synagogue and I'm at West London. And there are good relationships between the senior rabbis as well. So we're seeing more of that. Uh, there's also been the opportunity for people, for instance, my Lincolnshire community that I served for 10 years, uh, they were able to join on, uh, into services anywhere in the United Kingdom that they felt like that, that they could get a Zoom link for. So they, that's really expanded people's connection, the, uh, the collaborations among the smaller and the larger congregations, I think is something that we've begun. Will it continue? It's really hard to predict. Thank you. And Jason? Uh, so Ottawa is a small town. Uh, I know it's got a large uh, land mass area, but we have a, a million people in Ottawa and Jews about 14,000. Um, so we naturally have always sought out whatever connections with the rest of the community, the other branches of Judaism and, and flavors and so forth as we can. I think during the pandemic, we are seeing a little bit more um, collaboration. Um, the, I will, what I'll say is that the clergy in my perception of it, my, the clergy in general across the different flavors of Judaism in Ottawa, uh, are getting along really well. We always have. We co collaborate on a number of different things throughout the year. The pandemic, I think what it's done is, is it, generally speaking, it has created this global Jewish community. Um, but it, but it's so, such, a, such a big change from what it was that we're talking about collaborating with Jews all over the world, not just more Jews in, in Ottawa. 
you know, like this, like my congregants are, 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 are here with us. And, and I'm, it's a pleasure to see people from, from all over Europe that I've known or that I, I'm seeing for the first time. But that's, that's one of the things the pandemic has done. I think more so than, than um, create more uh, interactions within Ottawa. Um, but it certainly just reminds us that um, we, we can be Jews together uh, and, and support. We have a wonderful federation in Ottawa, which does tons of stuff together, um, and uh, including, including fundraising and supporting the entire community in the pandemic. And I think it's really, really beautiful. Um, I hope all of that continues and that the events that we do do together, you know, us with our you know, Chabad colleagues and, and families and our, and our um, uh, reform, you know, the, the youth from our movement and the reform movement uh, regularly get together. We have annual, we have Jewish Ottawa Youth Joy that does events three times a year. Actually, the pandemic's put a little bit of a, a kink in that works because um, we're just not able to get together for a massive 200 kid Megillah reading uh, the way we have in the past. So there's, there's give and take in all of this and we'll get through it and we'll, we're, we're constantly working with our colleagues around the Ottawa community to find new ways to, to do things together. Uh, thank you. I know in Iron Megillah this year, it was a very lonely experience. It was literally me, 10 men in the shul dotted around the entire shul and everything else was on, was on uh, Zoom or, or, or over the telephone. And it was, it was all a bit weird. Yeah. Well, We've we've come to uh, we've come to to the end. I'm going to go over in a second uh, to Alex Klein uh, just uh, uh, to uh, say thank you to everybody, etc. But um, just uh, I want to give my own personal thanks to Jason and to Gershon and of course to um, to, to Benny for for your time. Uh, this has been uh, the second, but actually uh, the second in the series, but actually the first time we've actually had a panel. Um, so thank you very much for being guinea pigs in that respect. Um, this is where I do remind everybody that uh, we this is this is a series. The next in the series is called Passover in the Pandemic. It's on two weeks today, Wednesday, the 31st of March. I'd like to apologize to those people who tuned in one hour late. I know a couple of you did. And um, this was because I did explain earlier, we had made a special concession to our brothers and sisters uh, in North America, whose clocks went forward last weekend and ours didn't. And that completely caught us out. We weren't expecting that. Um, and uh, uh, it was such that we, we moved the time west of the Azores because our panelists uh, uh, had already signed up to the time uh, in North America that they had said that they could do. So next week we're back to 7 p.m., 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. west of the Azores in the UK, Europe and Israel and South Africa. Um, but just let me say that you've asked about, a number of you have asked about a recording. Yeah, sorry about that, Rachel. A number of you had asked about a recording. Uh, what we will do <clears throat> is we'll clean up the recording. I'll take all the bloopers out that I made, um, but obviously keep them in the ones that the panelists made. We're actually trialing this as a podcast Podcast. Um, and if you go onto our website, which is um, simply http dot etc forward slash canters.eu, that's the important bit, canters.eu, all the information uh, is on there. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Alex just for a final thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Russell for a wonderful session and our participants, Jason. <laughs> Benny and Gershon. It was such a fascinating evening of entertainment, of questions that were answered. The honesty was superb and um, being uh, upfront, that's what it's all about. Thank you very much for participating and I hope you join us for our next session, which is Passover in the Pandemic and that will be hosted by a fellow executive member, Hirsch Cashman, and uh, we look forward to seeing you and your friends at our next session. Please be safe, please be careful, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Russell, and all my colleagues. Thank you. Bye-bye now. <laughs>